I'm glad everyone could come and join for this weekend's, the Sunday uh, Rising Tide Foundation lecture, where we are continuing on our journey through storytelling, uh, myth-making, and universal history. So uniting these different branches that are often treated as separate compartmentalized fields of study, um, that is no longer the case. We're, we're breaking down the walls. We're actually looking at a full spectrum approach to universal history from the standpoint of the creative spirit of how creativity shapes history for good and, and also uh, by virtue of being truly creative, it also means that you're going to challenge certain vested power structures that always will try to entrench themselves into society. Um, that's part of the human condition and that will make um, enemies at different points in time. So truly creative people who are whose reason and imagination are tied to their developed matured consciences will always tend to uh, also uh, display a high degree of courage because they're they know what they're up against, but they will also tend to often speak in not so linear of a manner. Um, they will wrap a lot of their messaging in the form of their stories and, and insights in the form of metaphor of poetic imagery, um, which tells a story, but not in, in the direct literal way that one would sometimes expect it if we were thinking like computers. So <clears throat> What better uh, model do we have than the great Frederick Schiller, who, I mean, he wasn't, he didn't live a long time, but his time in the material domain on earth was spent in a very, he didn't waste time. He used his time very well and with a high density of creative output that will continue to have value for as long as humankind exists. Uh, Nicholas Jones is a close friend. He's an advisor to the Rise and Tide Foundation. He is the president of Artists Alliance for Africa, who's been working in Africa every year for a number of years, uh, training generations of ballet dancers um, and himself being an international uh, ballet dancer who has da who's worked in varieties of countries around the world from Asia, Europe, and North America. Maybe more, Nick, correct me, more? Maybe more, yeah, probably more. more. Yeah, definitely more, but okay. yeah. I think Nick uh, has a very Schillerian uh, bent to his soul, and thus I was very happy that he was willing to do a presentation on a particular uh, interesting play that Schiller tackled, um, which I'm not going to say anything more about. That's Nick's job, um, called Mary Stewart. So I'll say that Mary Stewart is the name of the play. And uh, Nick, I'll just give the stage to you. Go for it. Thanks, Matt. What a great introduction. So, like, welcome everyone today. I'm really excited for this. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. And then... So... Hello, everyone, today. Um, here we have a class on Friedrich Schiller, and we're, we're doing it in, in two parts. So first I'm gonna take us through a lecture that uh, Schiller did called, uh, it, it's about on universal history. And we're gonna look at that first, which is kind of the form um, that he's presenting uh, to as a backdrop to this play and how we perceive it and how we, uh, how, how we can make sense of these things for our current age. So welcome and uh, let's begin. So what is and to what end do we study universal history? Uh, this was a, a matter like uh, very deeply important to, to Schiller and something that he uh, became very dear to him because actually he took on the role of professor. So he was, uh, his first lecture was given um, as a newly appointed professor at Jane University. And uh, this happened on May 26th, 27th in uh, 1789, which just to mention is about 200 years to the, to the year almost after this, this event, Mary Stewart uh, and her execution takes place. So it's a 200 year gap. And uh, this post was arranged for him by his good friend, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe another brilliant playwright and uh, writer coming from this time in Germany, the, the Weimar Republic. So Schiller, uh, he wanted to get started with a bang and he wished to set the tone for his studies and teachings on what he considered universal history with this speech. 
Uh, the speech, it's about 18 pages long, depending on the size of, of your book. So it's quite, it's, it's very dense. And I would encourage everybody here, like, go and take 20 minutes to read it yourself, because that's really all it is. Uh, but then the thought process that goes in, I, I've read it now, I think seven, eight times, because it, it, every time you read it, there's so many layers. It, it's so dense, the manifolds in terms of like the metaphorical aspects of what he's talking about, that the ideas that can, can kind of come, all the variations of this theme that he sets for you uh, are quite wonderful. And you can really uh, play around with what he's telling you. Um, so he 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 does this speech and the students of the university equally eager to receive his ideas they they pack the room to listen and the room is so packed that even the ones the students that couldn't get into the room they um they organize like a, a march outside um for the sake of getting a larger room because they can't fit so they actually you know have a little protest about the fact that the room's not big enough for everyone in the university to listen to Schiller and, and they're, you know, they're disappointed. Hence the, um, the intensity of their learning and how, how serious they are about this, right? So this, these are the times. Um, so the poet of freedom considered that history holds certain important events and that these events have a universality about them, a, a theme, uh, usually found in the dramatic consequences that the actors have to deal with at the time. So uh, like this play that we'll go into, it's a very short period of time that he's talking about, but the the drama that takes place within this time um, is so important for the future that this this drama that takes place, this period, this experience, this uh, conflict between Mary and Elizabeth has the potential to be something uh, brilliant and has the potential to be has to be a, a heroic cause and could uh, bring about certain effects that would change uh, the world at the time or can end up being a tragedy in which it does end up being a tragedy and uh, Schiller actually paints a very vivid picture of where those mistakes are made even in Mary herself who we're going to go into that later those those kind of the dramatization of these characters so onwards we can look at what is universal history? So this is my piece on universal history, and then we can, I'll talk some more after. Universal history, according to Schiller, are those events that hold the most important influences over the modern day world, so the contemporary world. The relation of those events to the time of now or current events is the universal aspect of which he speaks, and it is through that process of reason that we as individuals can look at history not as a linear collection of events in chronological order, uh, like the time is the most important aspect of them, but rather as a non-linear whole, where the dramatic consequences of those events still vibrate today and are in fact of an immortal nature, and the events of today equally have their origin in those very events from which that wave begun. So there's a, um, there's a simultaneity, there's a theme, there's, there's something which is recurring, but not simply recurring they're, 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 because that, that would be static and that would just be a, a vicious, uh, you know, a continual loop. But no, this, this actual theme is changing as well. It's, it's uh, increasing its order. So history has real lessons for the individual that are nonlinear and that are universal for all human beings throughout all time. These themes that are played out through various different times have universal aspects to them that hold the potential to serve future populations in their understanding of that which we call universal history. So that's my personal take on um, Schiller's words for the sake of not being able to write all 18 pages. But um, this is also why I encourage everybody to read it. We, we, can, we need to be able to put these things into our own words. And so when he talks about universal history, like when you're going to read it, there's, he actually gives a lot of examples too about, um, for example, ideology or philosophy and how, and how that uh, has vibrations into the future and is, is a certain frequency that uh, defines civilizations or like a golden renaissance uh, kind of process that has been unraveling itself uh, 
not just on the European continent, but, but internationally for many centuries now. And you have these kind of uh, things that occur. And they're not static. They actually, um, they can even, like they can even disappear for a moment to be reborn again. So like, that's what you'd say like happened in the dark age where uh, the works of the Greeks, for example, Plato, Aristotle, they, they were lost. And um, you, you would say a lot of other works, not just these two guys, but a lot of other works were lost during this time. Um, and that's all, they were lost. It's not that they've disappeared because there, there is that immortality to them and they, they will be reborn somewhere in the mind of someone um, through a process of uh, research and development and just you know clawing away at the surface till you find that which is the truth. So yeah, that's uh, what Schiller considers universal history. It's not something that is a step-by-step -step process. It's not evolving simply out of um, causes, but it also, has a, a whole nature to it that often rebounds to its origin from, from that point in the future that it changed. You can also take that point in the future and retrace it back to that origin, and there will be a, a bridge, a connection between these two events. So if you, yeah, Schiller actually gives plenty of examples. Uh, there's, uh, he talks about the French Revolution and uh, such events that, uh, both have a tragic nature, but also have a heroic nature uh, like Joan of Arc. So we can study those in our own time, should we have the time. But today we're gonna to look at Mary Stuart and talk about those dynamics more. So the second part of on universal history, to what end do we study universal history? Um, which is something that I spoke about a bit just now, like do we, is it necessary to study all of history to understand what is universal about it? Probably not. So according to Schiller, he talks about this idea of the, the bread fed scholar. And uh, it's quite funny actually when you read this lecture because for ages, it seems, he's going on about this bread fed scholar and he's laughing at this bread fed scholar. And I'm sure people in the room who are listening, because I did, they're like laughing too, because he's just, he's ripping bread fed scholars and, you know, turning all of these people who, well, first I need to explain what the breadhead scholar is. So, history and all of its magnitude would be useless to study or record if it did not. Sorry, I need to move this. History and all of its magnitude would be useless to study or record if it did not have some effect on the future. The very fact that humans feel the need to make a record of particular events in history speaks to the innateness of such action and our need to draw and understand theme and variations in a whole like time. Merely recording events is useless, but the recording of certain historic events is due to their universal nature and the paradigmatic shifts that occur around them. Their ability to create waves of change can be traced far into the future events too. And so we find ourselves studying history, not for the sake of being like the bread fed scholar who Schiller talks about, who merely does so for praise and accolades and um, awards, and simply just to pass the test, essentially. Universal history as an honest reflection of our collective character shows us that that universal quality in us that can lift our souls upward towards the heavens, reason. So not merely just to record events for the sake of recording them, but to have a process of reason, which, you know, governs, the two parts of our mind and it comes to understand why an event or why a tragedy or why a heroic moment even took place in, in, in the very first place. What, what enables people to do anything at all? What is the birth of action? Well, reason. If it's good, that action. And if it's not, it will probably be tragic. And uh, if it's based around sense, it will turn into savagery and fall into the hands of whim and uh, find the very small people like it did with the French Revolution. But if it's based around reason, you will have a, uh, a different result, like uh, you could argue like in the, the fight for American independence, which was a successful battle against oligarchy and was a, another increase of the universal order on the planet for the sake of 
uh, this huge space of territory becoming a, one of the first republics in the world and increasing the, the rights of all men and setting those uh, principles down on paper as something which was self-evident. It's the first nation to really go and do this on, on, on such a you know direct level in opposition to the British Empire, which represents the status quo and the oligarchy, which wishes not to change anything and uh, you know kills science and technology and development. So that's why I said in the right here, these events oftentimes fall prey to romanticism. And as Schiller said about the French Revolution, a great moment has found the little people. Those little people, unfortunately, were sold out on the ideal ideology of the Enlightenment. And often today, people will tell you that the American independence was born out of the Enlightenment period or, or some rubbish like this, when in fact it's it's not at all. It's actually coming from the great men like the, the Germans, the classical German writers, uh, Schiller, Lessing, uh, Goethe, Leibniz, essentially, of course, who's before all of them. And so there we have it. Um, universal history has these these links, these waves, and they are universal and they are uh, not static. They will continue to create change. And um, that's where we have hope. That's where we can find hope, actually, in understanding that and being reasonable with that. So moving on, I have some quotes from Schiller to back up. Uh, I wanted to, of course, give you his own words because of, it's, it's essential, though we don't have the time today to go through the whole book, um, just to give you guys an idea. So when he's talking about uh, what is universal history, this quote, you know, uh, struck me. And uh, quote, the field of history is fetened and vastly encompassing. In its sphere lies the entire moral world that accompanies us through all the conditions mankind has experienced, through all the shifting forms of opinion. Through his folly and his wisdom, his deterioration and his ennoblement, history must give account of everything man has taken and given. So that's on what is universal history. And after this quote, actually, he goes into some more it's not specific examples, it's still metaphorical because he he is continuous in this approach, um, this method of dialogue. But it's way more beautiful because he's not he's not directing you by force, he's directing you by will. And uh, there's something that is born inside your soul that allows you to to think about what he's saying, not not just be told. So to what end do we study? He mentions this. Out of the entire sum of these events, the universal historian selects those which have had an essential, irrefutable, and easily ascertainable influence upon the contemporary form of the world. Therefore, which must be seen in order to assemble material for world history. So there's a duality here that in that he's saying like before you even would uh, collect these so-called events, there is a method governing the collection of events in that there needs to be linkage, there needs to be bondage between these events, otherwise I'm, I'm basically I'm not interested. If there's not a common thread, if there's not a theme to this, it's not, it's interesting, but it's not necessarily useful for the future. So we're, we're, we're getting to high and lofty ideals here. The third, uh, quote that I put in there is, world history thus proceeds from a principle, which is exactly contrary to the beginning of the world. The real succession of events descends from the origin of objects down to their most recent ordering. The universal historian ascends from the most recent world situation upwards toward the origin of things. So again, he has a different way, like he's talking like nature has this way of evolving like successive like uh, layered, like uh, in this way of um, building blocks. And uh, yeah, he's, he's talking about the session of events in, in the formation of the universe and the solar system and the planets and so on and so forth. He's like, but mankind, um, like the universal historian, like the, uni the, the global citizen, the world man, the world woman, they would consider history actually starting from the point by which they're at and work back towards the origin of things. 
So it almost there's this idea that the further we go into the future, the further we can see into the past, which is a very real thing, especially if you use technology, you, you, you think of the things that we've come to discover in terms of technology and how that enables us to actually look further into space, which is light coming from the past, uh, and also look further into our own history on this very planet, which we which we uh, embody. Uh, in terms, of, like you look at archaeology or, or practices like this in science, where we can use certain technology to see things that are not so obvious to the naked eye. Sorry, Nick. Just uh, can I say one one thing? Sure. Because he, he's also saying too the the idea of um, it has to be useful in terms of having uh, application in our world that we live in. And it can't just be like one of these studies where you could just spend years studying some obsolete, you know, little piece of history of like med medieval uh, agriculture in Poland or something where it has no bearing on anything that you're living in in the world that you're in, right? <laughs> Not really. I mean, unless like unless anyone else can tell us otherwise, but that's the thing. There's no common uh, good in that. It's, it's just a uh, going down a rabbit hole, like in Alice in Wonderland, right? You're just going down rabbit holes. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no end in sight to something like that, because what's the reason? Why are you doing it? What, what's going to be the conclusion for this? What's the greater good? So it was. it's in the, the, the lecture specifically, and I think it's somewhere in the quote that we mentioned it, like that thing of, um, if it's not useful, I, I don't necessarily need to learn it. What The things that are important to learn in these are, events are the universal factors um yeah so without further ado i would like to now like move on to the play um yeah so, so yeah and the reason i want to move on to the play is because before we do the actual drama i understand that you know Schiller would have had a lot of historical context for this. So he, he wouldn't have just written a play. This play actually took him a year to write. So in that year, he's, he's done a lot of study on the, the form, the, the, the actual context, what is happening around these two figures. Um, yes, they're tragic. Yes, this happens. Yes, that happens. We got the ending, but I need to know what sets all of this up. So we're going to have to do a little bit of that. And here we go. So the year is uh, 1587. Queen Elizabeth I is the monarch in England, and she's been monarch since 1558, and she's going to rule until 1603. At the time of her death, her rule, at the time of Mary's death, I must be specific, her rule has, has already been 29 years. So when, when she finally does decide to execute Mary, uh, 29 years on the throne, and just to mention, uh, 19 years of which, Mary's in prison. So all this time, and um, she's keeping her locked up in, for all this time and just moving her from house to house. So uh, Mary's undergoing this really, uh, this, this period of suffering, which is really, really uh, hard to, to make sense of for her because actually up until now she hasn't committed the crime. So there's a big big problem. Um, after the death, 14 tragic years will follow, uh, as we see with the, the geopolitical aspects that we're going to look at, like Spanish Armada and the war that starts between England and Spain. But at this time, also worth noting is their age. They're, they're not children anymore. Mary and Elizabeth are respectively 45 and 54 years old at this point when Mary finally gets ex executed. So they're not spring chickens. They're, they're women. They are stately. They've been around um, and they've been dealing with these people, these agents around them for a long time now. So they should be able to navigate this. I mean, I think that's what Schiller's also kind of talking about. Like, there is a possibility at least of navigating this, this, this conflict. So England-Spain war begins on the back of this religious schism between Protestants and Catholics. And the execution of Mary, who's a Catholic, exalts the basis exacerbates the conflict further to the point of it becoming a, a grand physical war. It's already a, a, a war in the sense of like with the pirates in the, the Atlantic and stuff. Um, there's a lot of piracy going on along the trade routes and British sailors are particularly effective at um, 
causing uh, problems with the Spanish and basically causing problems for their shipping routes. And uh, the Venetian oligarchy at the same time has a bit of an issue uh, with these trading routes because uh, they don't want expansion to happen into the new world, essentially. And there's this idea like they want it, maybe if they do want it to happen under their control. So there's lots of things happening. Also, Portugal is opening up new shipping routes around the world that is uh, circumventing the, the Spanish Empire and um, it's causing problems for Venice as well. And actually, it's at this time that the Venetian party, they actually consider already then building a Suez Canal to bypass um, or to, yeah, to create a, a position of power where they would rule, where they would control the trading routes. So that's what empire is looking to do all the time. So England is constantly wary of the old alliance, which is forged between France and Scotland for the fact that they remain Catholic states. Uh, Scotland remains Catholic too, even though England makes the change to the Anglican church. Um, this happens under King Henry VIII, whereby the king was made the head of faith uh, and put at the, the head of the church, which of course is obvious problems with that. And the Pope was replaced by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Canterbury and he's not really a, a he's not he's not a Pope who actually has free like you know who has his character and can say what he wants. Actually, he's he's more a servant of the king. So that's how it becomes uh, completely distorted. This so-called religious system. It's not a religious system at all. It's it's an oligarchic empirical system just put in place to basically get Henry VIII what he wants in the form of his marriages with these women. Um, we're going to go into this a little bit more. So this system actually remains in place to this day. Uh, we still have the same system in place, just to mention. This is where the British Empire begins. So to continue, Mary Stuart, she's raised most of her life in France. Um, and France, uh, when, um, I'm trying to keep this in order, when Louis the 11th and, uh, in basically in the 1460s and 70s, Louis the 11th is king of France and he's considered a philosopher king as is Henry the seventh in England who, uh, unifies England out of civil war, uh, and goes about restoring the country in all of its ways. Uh, the state, the statehood of the country, he restores it and he makes England a nation state, uh, creates a formation that is uh, raising the standards of living and also does a lot of infrastructure building and so on and so forth. We actually call him the Winter King because for us, he oversees the dark winter, the transition from the winter into the spring, where the rebirth in England actually starts. So that that's, he is our Renaissance, Henry VII. He is our Renaissance King. And uh, his son is, um, so yeah, when Mary is sent to France, she's the ruler in France at the time is, is a philosopher king. He's Louis XI. Um, I think his name was Louis the Pious. And basically he's brilliant and France is undergoing enormous um, agricultural expansion and lots of standard living are increasing. And uh, they are leading one of the leaders of the Renaissance also, they are um, central in organizing the League of Cambrai, which we're going to talk about in, the, in a little bit more. So originally, uh, Mary Stuart, who is this uh, Scottish princess, who is the daughter of Margaret Tudor, Henry VII's daughter and Henry VIII's sister. The original plan was for Mary Stuart to be married off to Edward I, who was Henry VIII's son, and it would have created a unification because they, they were trying to get Scotland and England to come together under a kingdom. But essentially, the Scots disagreed. Uh, I wanted to look into the reason, but well, yeah, it's another story. And uh, new wars are born out of this. So France and uh, Scotland and England go back to having war intermittently from the 14th century onwards. And Henry VII is actually uh, trying to sort this out. But the trouble is he's uh, contended with the civil war. So first he deals with the civil war. It's called the War of the Roses. He defeats Richard I to claim the throne of England. Richard I is this awful king who actually is responsible for killing the two nephews that should have become king. Uh, and he buried them in the Tower of London. Uh, if anybody goes to the Tower of London, they'll, this is one of the most famous stories that you can see people see the ghosts of the princes because they're buried below the stairs of one of the towers. 
And it was Richard I who did that. So barbaric times, lots of awful things happening, you know, family killing family. Henry VII comes along, restores the nation, creates a nation state. So being a far more Compton and creative leader, Henry VII, after the War of the Roses, he tries to reach an alliance with James IV of Scotland and almost succeeded because actually he marries his daughter to James IV and his daughter is Margaret Tudor. And uh, this alliance almost succeeds and was going very well, but then Henry VII dies unexpectedly. And of course, the vultures are already there waiting to land. And in often when kings in these times, when they change, there's a period of great uncertainty, right? Um, but not so much with this one, because you have Henry VIII, who's definitely already ready. Thomas More is his educator. So Thomas More has been educating and tutoring, tutoring this young Henry VIII, who, by the way, was actually not supposed to become king. Uh, Arthur, his older brother, was supposed to become king. And it's Arthur who is married to Catherine of Aragon to make an alliance with Spain first for the sake of the fact that Arthur was expected to become king. But Arthur dies unexpectedly two months or a year after getting married to Catherine of Aragon. Henry is the next in line. Thomas More does a great job of educating Henry and uh, trying to calm that brash nature of his. But due to the timing of the death and the, 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 the issue that we have with Catherine of Aragon and the sake of, for the sake of the fact that for the first nine years of their marriage, they don't produce a child. And um, it's all about this thing. There's this form in the time that you needed to produce a baby and not just that you needed to produce a baby boy. Uh, that was the rule. The rule is if you don't have a baby boy, all hell breaks loose. So it's very static and it's you know, a real problem, these monarchies, but that was the rule. And um, Henry VIII, not expecting to become king, suddenly you know, sprung into the spotlight. He's somewhat ready, but he has this brash nature. He hasn't been taking things maybe so seriously, and all of a sudden he is going to be the king. And it happens very quickly. And then he's kind of like pushed into, you know, marrying his brother's ex-wife, which is already pretty uncomfortable, I think, for most people. And um, then upon marrying her, because the thing is, when she was married to Arthur, her and Arthur both got sick. And uh, they're not sure to this day what the sickness was, but it seems to be that possibly the sickness has, has caused infertility in Catherine of Aragon or, or something because she's not producing child. Nine years go by, finally, a child is produced and that's Mary first, Bloody Mary, who's going to make a comeback later, not such a good one. Because this, this doesn't end here, it just it gets, it's going to get more tragic because, yeah. The slow creep of evil into this family is, is, is tragic. So the time found a conflicted man, and though Thomas More would pay with his life for trying to avoid such circumstances, um, Thomas Wolsey also did. Thomas Wolsey is the cardinal in England, he's the Pope's representative, and he put up a fight, like an almighty fight, to keep Henry from doing what he was what he went and did, which is break away from the Catholic Church. Um, it's you know, still not clear to me why this marriage, why this divorce could not be settled. Uh, it seems to be a grand mistake on lots of people's part as to why they could not get the divorce because, you know, it's not that Henry didn't wait. First waits nine years to get a baby, then the baby comes out and it's a girl. He's, you know, even more frustrated. And eventually he um, makes bad, bad choices. So Mary Stewart is the daughter of Margaret Tudor. Henry VIII's sister, who married James IV of Scotland, as I said. This was Henry VII's bid to make peace. His son and son-in-law failed to keep that peace. So Henry VIII and uh, James IV of Scotland, they fell into war with each other after Henry VII was dead. And this essentially is due to the interference of the Venetian agents, agents Paolo Sarpi and Francesco Zorzi. Um, yeah, these people are circling. They're, they're, they don't want to see uh, England and Scotland come to an alliance. There's a few other things that they don't want to see, but we're going to move onwards. So I want to talk about this 
a uh, very important part because there's this background information to all of this, um, which is just essential and I couldn't leave it out. So here we have a family tree so that everyone can, you know, because it's it gets a bit confusing at some point and we will sometimes have to take a look to remind ourselves of the order of things. So here, if you see my cursor, this is Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. This is Tudor House, the House of Roses, the Red Rose, the House of Plantagenet. He's actually coming from France, I think, Henry VII. Um, so he has a son, the first one, Arthur, as we see here. And as you can see, Arthur dies when he's uh, 16. So a year after he married, he married her in 1501. He dies in 1502. This is Catherine of Aragon, who he marries. Reason he marries her is because he's actually supposed to become king. And this is supposed to be like a holy alliance. League of Cambrai formed in 1508. Arthur Tudor, Catherine of Aragon, Spain and England, holy alliance. This would have defeated the Venetians, one, because it would have brought um, the schism. Well, the schism that hasn't happened yet. But there are some wars going on between the nation states. There is some like conflict, and Venice is doing everything in its power to exacerbate that into a full blown European war. But um, these philosopher kings are stopping it from happening. And they are the safeguards. And Arthur would be a continuance because he's also educated by Thomas, Thomas More. It's just the fact that he dies. Henry is thrown into the limelight. He's not ready uh, quite. And more importantly, there's this young nature in him. Uh, there's this thing in women, like it's it's the sexual side of him, the sensual part of the man. He 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 just can't help himself. There's this thing. And then these agents around him, Paolo Sarpi and Francesco Zorzi, they they catch wind of basically what his downfall is, his vanity. It's, uh, any woman who shows that she likes Henry, he he just goes for her. So they supplant Anne Boleyn, who is working with Thomas Cromwell. Thomas Cromwell is a Protestant of the time, a Reformation agent, and he is definitely uh, organizing Anne Boleyn to um, float around Henry as much as possible and just do whatever you can to make him make a mistake. Like we need a mistake. We need to open up this and cause ruptures. To which he does, mostly willingly, and uh, Thomas More tries to stop him. So first Thomas Wolsey, the Cardinal, tries to stop him. He pays with his life. Thomas More tries to stop him, pays with his life. Anybody who tries to reason with Henry essentially pays with their life. And um, essentially out of this, the Anglican Church is created. So the Venetian agents that I mentioned, Paolo Sarpi and Francesco Zorzi, and there's others as well, like Thomas Cromwell, who are who are English and witting, or like the Earl of Leicester. These agents close to Henry orchestrate the formation of the Church of England on a Venetian Byzantine model, which caused a major rupture in relations with Spain and France, who at the time were part of the League of Cambrai. And it's interesting to note, because I have something on this here, like when Martin Luther King, uh, sorry, I keep doing this, when Martin Luther, issued grievances about the Catholic Church in 1517, King Henry VIII took it upon himself to personally repudiate the arguments of the Protestant Reformation leader. The Pope rewarded Henry with the lofty title of Fide Defensor, the defender of the faith. Right? So like that's the irony of this. Like Henry VIII, the decade before, is actually saying that Luther is a you know is a crazy man and like what's he talking about basically? Like you have no reason. You're you've just gone off uh, out of pure frustration and created this schism and uh, attacks him pretty, pretty, you know, directly. And then, well, basically, because he doesn't get his own way later on when he's in his like early 30s, you know, finally gives into his frustrations and uh, makes the split himself. And uh, what the, the, the other funny thing about it is that he doesn't become a Protestant. King Henry VIII stays as a practicing Catholic for the rest of his life. He just allows all of these agents around him to go about building the form to get him the wife that he needs to have a boy. So there's this, it's, it's really tragic actually how that happens. But we've got to move on because it's not about Henry VIII. 
So Elizabeth Reign, basically what you're seeing is the role of these Venetian agents within the, the elite or the oligarchy of England at the time, which is not all bad, of course. Um, there are people who, who want to develop the country and want to invest and they want to actually build a nation. Like they're of Henry VII's uh, side of things and they're still on that side, but they've got to be quiet because Thomas More and Wolsey are now dead and like, you know, everybody knows what that means. So these agents as well, who are whispering in the ears of these, these monarchs, uh, one of them, Earl of Leicester, creates uh, what is called the Venice Company, uh, later morphs into East India, uh, East India Trading Company uh, when it merges with another company. So this is actually the, the real foundation of what would become British Empire or British empirical uh, oligarchy on an international level. Uh, and he helped fund the Puritan movement in England too. And Lord Francis Walsingham, who was her like, you know, who was like her James Bond, uh, created the British intelligence. I say intelligence because of course we all know it's not, but, um, and Roger Asham, it was just funny because I was talking to Matt about this guy the other day and I, I had it wrong. So I, I re-looked at the, the guy and it turns out he was just a, a really bad teacher. And he was, uh, implanted actually around uh mary and elizabeth the two daughters of uh king henry and he would do these things, like he'd never let them see each other for example i mean they were they were for a large part of their lives in two different countries but there was no contact between the family actually they, they were all split up and they were taught by these tutors like roger asian who's an aristotelian and basically um more interested in form um, and than anything more interested in the way uh, vanity like the way something's done um in terms of like the formation of it so he makes a particular comment about her handwriting at some point and that he's he's more astounded by the cleanliness of her handwriting than the quality of her actual what she's writing about um he never once talks about the actual um what is important about this woman it doesn't seem that much is she's just very good at doing her homework this is Elizabeth. So um, my question is, uh, essentially, out of all of this, could Elizabeth and Mary of Scots risen above the circumstances of the time and change the future for, for the greater good? And I think that's also what this drama is somewhat kind of getting at. So I just want to say a little bit more about certain things. Um, we also have, uh, I just want to say, Something else, or was that it? Yeah, Thomas Cromwell, he's a uh, part of the Venetian system as well. Um, he actually went to work in Venice uh, as an accountant to the well known leading spirituali of the time, uh, Reginald Pole, uh, who actually had a claim to the throne. Reginald Pole, it was like something sixth or seventh in line, but he actually had a claim to the throne. So there might have been a bit, a bit of that in it as well. Not that necessarily these people want to rule because they actually don't like to be in the in the light. They don't they don't want to be seen. Uh, Cromwell, by the way, uh, under Henry VIII, he effectively ran the the British government uh, for ten years before he also eventually because Thomas Cromwell is one of the guys who helps get Thomas More killed. And for anybody who is interested, uh, you should watch A Man for All Seasons. It's a beautiful drama. Uh, that you can find, I think it's on YouTube. And uh, if you want to get insight into this period of time, that's that's your movie. Go and watch that and you'll, you'll have a full understanding of the period of Henry VIII and the battle between Thomas More and Thomas Cromwell and those those new agents. They called themselves uh, the new boys, the, the, the new youngsters or something. They're a group of basically like, uh, it's like a university, like based off of the Padua University, which is, developing these agents uh, to so some of these it was like it was called little padua actually this organized this uh these what these leading leading figures created as kind of like a hellfire club uh, so those people were roger asham uh, the teacher of elizabeth john cheke william and william cecil and this tight-knit group uh tutors of the protestant children of henry the eighth edward and elizabeth especially but also when mary uh, Tudor came back from Spain. This uh, Roger Asian also had his hand on her 
ideology and uh, was was manipulating her. So yeah, and I actually read about him on Wikipedia and they had the audacity to say um, one of his great skills was his ability to maneuver and outmaneuver these monarchs at the time. They actually said that and I was like, whoa, that's that's pretty explicit if, if you've read a little bit about it. So now I want to talk about Mary. We've given some background. I've got Elizabeth here. Um, we're just going to go through her, but then we are going to talk about Mary and then we're going to look at the play. I actually look at it. I'm going to show you the video. We're going to look at it in German with the actual image and then we're going to look at uh, a recording in English and then we're actually going to read the book, I think, as well, just to get some uh, fullness of the context. So uh, Elizabeth I, she's representing the status quo of the oligarchy that refuses change and is instead gripped by vanity and empire. She is a continuation of the kind of monarch that Henry VIII set himself up to be. The God-given status as ruler serves their vanity wonderfully. And uh, yeah, her character in a drama is full of vain ideals about herself. Her image of self is unchanging and unwilling to reason with how she feels. Putting Mary to, these are just some uh, side notes before we go and look at it, just, just for people to think about. Putting Mary to death is unthinkable for her, actually. Like, she's still a human being. Uh, and it, she has this thing as she's going through the drama, when you read it, you're going to see, like, she, it's mostly coming from vanity. It's not like uh, love, but there is a part of her which is generally like, uh, this is my family, I feel bad about this because she's blood, so there is that. It's not that she can ignore that, but she's making it about like her reign, like she's making it about me, 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 like how does this reflect upon me? How will my legacy look if I go and kill this person who really, up until now, I don't really have any evidence for doing this, apart from this guy Babington, who's like, we found these letters, who it's, it's all very like being um, manufactured by Walsingham, who's, who's the head of British intelligence at the time. And, and a Venetian agent. So there's this part of her which is based in vanity, and yet some part of her considers this woman a sister, and that part of her is genuinely love. But she she won't she will not build a bridge to it. In the end, Schiller makes clear her choice, not that it makes her feel any better thereafter. So that's why I talk about the 14 years of tragedy that come after, because actually this image on the right side is Elizabeth in all her splendor with that impossibly tiny waist of hers and um she looks like a burlesque and um on under her right hand is the world well that's pretty um explicit like we can see uh her vain aspirations and also behind her on the left side here we have the spanish armada um which she defeated so that's like her uh moment right it's like a god moment like we defeated the spanish empire and it's like no you've actually been coerced by the venetian oligarchy to do something that you both could have avoided and europe could have gone on a much better trajectory had you not fallen into this quarrel with with uh europeans just across the waves so and on the right side, I'm actually not aware because the quality of the image is not so good. But I'm sure there is representation here. Uh, it looks like uh, skeletons or something, something quite dark. Um, I just wonder. But yeah, the, the actual quality of the painting is not so good. I've seen this image so many times actually growing up. They always show this one. And um, this is worth looking at, I suppose. Uh, she tries to blame. In the, in the drama, you're going to see, she at the end, when she's done it, she actually tries to pass it off that she didn't make the decision. So there's this, like, vanity again. She's like, I didn't do that. And she tries to blame the people around her, but her acting is also in vain. The stage, I mean the stage, like the whole stage, everybody who's on the stage with her is aware of her tragedy, no matter how she pretends to interpret events. So this is also something that Sheila makes aware to us. like. It's like very awkward, um, awkward moment because everybody knows what has happened. Um, but 
but she she doesn't she doesn't want to move from this place she's like i did not do this i left the paper on my table you took it though i signed it i did not ask you to take it why did you take it your fault that she's dead now you're going to prison this is actually what she does to her servant to her butler it's his fault for taking the paper away even though that's what she insinuated and she strongly insinuated to take the paper away um and then after that's you know that apparently the butler shouldn't have done that so history has been served but she was unwilling to make choices that, that would have served the common good and now we look at mary before we're going to look at the play so i just have something in the chat here oh brilliant so mary stewart Ah, oh, also, before I go on about Mary, I just wanted to say something about that last image. You see Elizabeth in all her splendor, the actual way that it's been painted, the, the, the quality of the painting uh, and the shade in the painting is of not a very high nature. It is very uh, two dimensional. And we have the feeling that this monarch wishes to be represented like this, like actually like static, like something which is like she's trying to cement her place in history but it's not natural it's like by force and um she certainly has cemented her place in history but as we find it's it's not for the reasons that i'm sure she with all that vanity would have wanted uh, which is the irony of it right these, these paradoxes are, are beautiful because that's the real tragedy here like that she, that her her inability to change it's, it, and, and mary shows a different ability in that in that sense so I picked this uh, image of Mary also for that reason, is in that this woman that we see on this boat looking out to sea, this is Mary Stewart, by the way, and um, this is a portrait of her that I found. And it's, it's really telling in the portrait, like the difference of image and, and then the realness, the, the, the genuine quality uh, in this woman and the reason she's uh, thoughtful, she's reflective, she has these natural qualities, these intuitive qualities that certainly Elizabeth uh, in the play, you see that she has them too. Uh, just for Elizabeth, she can't build a bridge between the, the, the rules and the way she feels. And she doesn't, she can't build a bridge. She could, she just doesn't, she doesn't even want to try. If there's no will to try and unify anything, so Mary exhibits that sublime character that Schiller pays particular attention to in all of his dramas. Uh, the, the character that is able to change, even with all the circumstances against them or seemingly against them, they're able to have these moments of the sublime uh, where the vortex moves in them and their, their soul shifts to a higher sense of order and uh, they can you know, bring about an action that could save the day or at least save the moment or save the time from being an absolute tragedy, but actually leave us with a sense of beauty around these tragic events. So in Act 3, Scene 3 and 4, because Scene 3 is the preparation for meeting Elizabeth and Scene 4 is the meeting of Elizabeth, Mary struggles to deal with her feelings towards Elizabeth. And though she does well to restrain herself, eventually she unfolds, you know, she's, she's restraining, she's like, oh, I don't want to do this. And, and she's like uh, trying to say all of the words that are not there. She's prepared this like speech to like get Elizabeth to bend, to get Elizabeth's soul to like move to compassion. And as she gets told the queen is coming, she's like, oh, I've lost all my words. Like, I don't know what to say. Blah, blah, blah. So she, she's not prepared. But then Elizabeth comes and Elizabeth is, we're going to see Elizabeth's not good to her. And um, Mary, as I say, she unfolds her true feelings eventually after Elizabeth poking her a lot. Uh, and really, Elizabeth is poking her, making accusations of all sorts of, you know, evil, evil things like you tried to kill me. Uh, and then that doesn't get her angry. So then she's like, yeah, so you're having sex with all these men. And then that doesn't work. And then eventually she like says something really, really painful. And then Mary turns around and says, well, you're a bastard queen. And it's just like, Bam. like Mary does such a good job of keeping it together and then like whoa there's this uh, moment and the pain is too much and she it's she's been in prison so long but it's also that she's so tired of the suffering she's so tired of being dragged around from place to place 
And it's not like every place that she's been in is bad. There's actually these these guys like Shrewsbury, who's a, a a duke or like a high up landowner in the play, and he's actually for a period of time put in charge of being her uh, keeper. He keeps her in his house as his prisoner, but he treats her really well because he he loves the nature of, of Mary Stuart, and yet that there's this thing happening with the men of the country who like the landowners of the country. They're coming to meet her because she's being passed around from place to place over these years. And they are actually falling in love with her. Not romantically. Um, it's not a romantic thing. They're falling in love with this character, this person who is like has this potential to be a real monarch and, and could possibly maybe restore England to the time of Henry the Seventh. Possibly. I think that's what we're going to talk. I want to talk about that after. What are the possibilities? What could have been? The heroic consequences instead of the tragic ones even there are beauty in both so upon this error of judgment just to move forward that mary does eventually atone for in act five scene seven we're going to look at these two specifically today for the sake of time mary does rise to a sublime state of mind and find herself capable of true forgiveness for her enemy this act of love represents one of the highest uh, forgiveness of those who have committed evil upon us this love is transformative and lifts a human soul up to reason and understanding. In her character, Mary shows the ability to self-reflect on matters of error in her judgment of the past. This image of her is evident throughout and shows her intuitive sense of humility and reason. Her final act is her greatest, though. We see a real transformation in all of those natural abilities. It's not just nature. She actually makes a choice to rise to the occasion and combine the best parts of herself to have this moment of like exquisite beauty. So I'm going to get out of the presentation because after this, that's my last page. We're going to talk about possibilities after. Um, I made the point the British Empire was spawned out of this age, so we should be aware of this all the time. But we can also ask ourselves what could have been had Mary lived. I also want to say what compelled Schiller to write this drama as a historical drama as a part of universal history. Uh, I want us all to take that question away with us and continue to manifest ideas out of it because this stuff is so rigorous, it's, there's so much going on in this time, we're in a renaissance, but at the same time the oligarchy is doing everything in its power to stop this um, natural flow of ideas taking place. And um, it's frantic, it's chaotic. And it's it's moving quick so like yeah so just to go now to the drama escape i have them set up already here for us so here we have act three scene three and off of the back of this the Earl of Leicester, who is this man right here. Can you see this, everyone? Matt, can you see this? Yes, indeed. Cool. Um, <clears throat> what's happening, like, this is the end of the, the scene. So just to give you the backdrop, he has just managed to convince Elizabeth, because, yeah, I'm not sure about the Earl of Leicester here. He's definitely an agent, but um, I'm still not really sure what Schiller's in kind of making out that he's doing. I wanted to focus on two women anyway, but uh, that's for everyone else to look at. Like, what is the Earl of Leicester doing here? He's actually managed to organize um, Elizabeth to approach Fotheringay Castle under the pretense of a hunt. But actually at Fotheringay Castle is Mary Stuart. And what Earl of Leicester has said to, Elizabeth knows this because of course she does. Um, and Elizabeth's like, well, why would I go there? She's there. And Earl of Leicester is like, well, you could go there and you might just run into her and get the chance to talk to her. Wouldn't that be nice? And uh, lo and behold, she's like, yeah, that's, that's not a bad idea. I mean, there's all that. I mean, not just it's a bad idea. There's a lot of vanity, like as you see here, the subtitle, like I, you needn't approach her doorstep because she's like resisting, but he's, he's using, um, he's pandering to her and she gives in and goes. So that's what we're going to watch now. Their first meeting and, uh, it doesn't go well. And it's... Auf deine Weiblichkeit hat ihre Rechte. 
Nicht wohl anständig wäre mir es, die Verwandte in Mangel und in Schmach zu sehen. Man sagt, dass sie nicht königlich umgeben sei. Vorwerfend wäre mir ihres Mangels Anblick. Nicht ihrer Schwelle brauchst du dich zu nahen. Hör meinen Rat. Heute ist das große Jagen. An Fotheringhay führt der Weg vorbei. Dort kann die Stuart sich im Park ergehen. Du kommst wie von ganz ungefähr dahin. Nichts darf als Vorbedacht erscheinen. Und wenn es dir zuwider ist, dann redest du sie gar nicht an. Begehe ich eine Torheit, so ist es deine, Lester, nicht die meine. Ich will dir heute keinen Wunsch versagen, weil ich von meinen Untertanen allen dir heute am wenigsten getan. Lass mich der neuen Freiheit genießen. Lass mich ein Kind sein. Sei es mit. Ihr eilet ja, als wenn ihr Flügel hättet. So kann ich euch nicht äußern. Wartet doch. Lass mich in vollen, in durstigen Zügen trinken. Die freie, die himmlische Luft. Ach, teure Lady, ihr seid außer euch. Die lang entbehrte Freiheit macht euch schwärmen. Es ist der liebe Hand, der ich sie danke. Graf lässt das mich den Arm erkennen, ich drin. Allmählich will man mein Gefängnis weiten. Durch Kleineres zum Größer mich gewöhnen, bis ich das Antlitz dessen endlich schaue, der mir die Bande löst auf immer. Ach, ich kann diesen Widerspruch nicht reimen. Noch gestern kündigt man den Tod euch an und heute wird euch plötzlich solche Freiheit. Hörst du das Jagdhorn? Ach, auf das mutige Ross mich zu schwingen. Zu frohe Jagd durch Feld und Hain. Nun, habe ich endlich recht gemacht, Milady. Verdiene ich einmal euren Dank. Vier Ritter. Seid ihr es, der diese Gunst für mich erwirkt? Ihr seid? Warum sollte ich es nicht sein? Ich war am Hof, ich überbrachte euer Schreiben. Ihr übergabt es, wirklich tatet ihr es. Und diese Freiheit, die ich jetzt genieße, ist eine Frucht des Briefs? Und nicht die einzige. Macht euch auf eine größere noch gefasst. Auf eine größere noch? Was meint ihr damit? Ihr hörtet doch die Hörner. Ihr schreckt mich. Die Königin jagt in dieser Gegend. Oh Gott. In wenig Augenblicken wird sie vor euch stehen. Ach, wie wird euch Lady E. erblasst? Warum hat man mich nicht vorbereitet? Jetzt bin ich nicht darauf gefasst. Komm, Hannah. Führ mich ins Haus, dass ich mich fasse, mich erhole. Bleibt, ihr müsst sie hier erwarten. Ich kann sie jetzt nicht sehen. Der Himmel rette mich vor dem verhassten Anblick. Kommt zu euch, Königin. Torwood. Fasst euren Mut zusammen. Bezwingt des Herzens Bitterkeit. Sie ist die Mächtige. Demütigt euch. Vor ihr? Ich kann es nimmer mehr. Tut's dennoch. Ruft ihre Großmut an. Trotzt nicht. Jetzt nicht auf euer Recht. Dazu ist nicht die Stunde. Ich bin zu schwer verletzt. Sie hat zu schwer beleidigt. Seht sie nur erst von Angesicht. Ich sah es ja, wie sie von eurem Brief erschüttert war. Ihr Auge schwamm in Tränen. Nein, sie ist nicht gefühllos. Hält dir selbst nur besseres Vertrauen. Darum eben bin ich vorausgeeilt, damit ich euch in Fassung setzen und ermahnen möchte. Ach, toll, Gott. Ihr wart stets mein Freund, dass ich in eurer milden Haft geblieben. Es war mir hart begegnet. Vergesst jetzt alles. Daran denkt allein, wie ihr sie unterwürfig wollt empfangen. Ist Burley auch mit ihr, mein böser Engel? Niemand begleitet sie als Graf von Lester. Graf von Lester? Fürchtet nichts von ihm. Es ist sein Werk, das euch die Königin begegnet. Ich wusste es wohl. Was sagt ihr? Die Königin! Wie heißt das Schloss? Fotheringhay. Hey. Schickt unser Jagdgefolg voraus nach London. Das Volk drängt allzu heftig in den Straßen. Wir suchen Schutz in diesem stillen Winkel. Ein gutes Volk liebt mich zu sehr. Unmäßig, abgöttisch sind die Zeichen seiner Freude. So ehrt man einen Gott, nicht einen Menschen. Aus diesen Zügen spricht kein Herz. Wer ist die Lady? Du bist zu Fotheringhay, Königin. Wer hat mir das getan, Lord Lester? Es ist geschehen, Königin. Und nun der Himmel deinen Schritt hierher gelenkt, so lass die Großmut und das Mitleid siegen.
Lass dich erbitten, ja königliche Frau, dein Auge auf die Unglückliche zu richten, die hier vergeht vor deinem Anblick. Der Himmel hat für euch entschieden, Schwester. Lasst mich nicht schmachvoll liegen, Schwester. Reicht mir die königliche Rechte, mich zu erheben von dem tiefen Fall. Ihr seid an eurem Platz, Lady Maria. Denkt an den Wechsel alles Menschlichen. Es lebt ein Gott, der jeden Hochmut rächt. Was habt ihr mir zu sagen, Lady Stuart? Ihr habt mich sprechen wollen. Ich vergesse die Königin, die schwer Beleidigte, und meines Anblicks Trost gewähre ich euch. Dem Trieb der Großmut folge, ich setze mich gerechtem Tadel aus, dass ich so weit heruntersteige. Denn ihr wisst, dass ihr mich habt ermorden lassen wollen. Oh Gott, gib meine Redekraft und nimm mir jeden Stachel, der verwunden könnte. Ihr habt an mir gehandelt, wie nicht recht ist. Denn ich bin eine Königin wie ihr. Und ihr habt als Gefangene mich gehalten. Ich kam zu euch als eine Bittende und ihr schlosst mich in Kerkermauern ein. Man stellt mich vor ein schimpfliches Gericht. Nichts mehr davon. Ein ewiges Vergessen bedecke, was ich Grausames erlitt. Seht, ich will alles eine Schickung nennen. Ihr seid nicht schuldig. Ich bin auch nicht schuldig. Ein böser Geist stieg aus dem Abgrund auf, den Hass in unseren Herzen zu entzünden, der unsere frühe Jugend schon entzweit. Er wuchs mit uns und böse Menschen fachten der unglückseligen Flamme Atem zu. Wahnsinnige Eifra bewaffneten mit Schwert und Dolch die unberufene Hand. Das ist das Fluchgeschick der Könige, dass sie entzweit die Welt in Hass zerreißen. Jetzt ist kein fremder Mund mehr zwischen uns. Wir stehen einander selbst nun gegenüber. Jetzt... Schwester redet, nennt mir meine Schuld. Ich will euch völliges Genüge leisten. Ach, dass ihr damals mir Gehör geschenkt, als ich so dringend euer Auge suchte. Es wäre nie so weit gekommen. Nicht die Geschicke. Euer schwarzes Herz klagt an. Die wilde Ehrsucht eures Hauses. Nichts Feindliches war zwischen uns geschehen, da kündigte mir euer Ohm, der stolze herrschwütge Priester, der die freche Hand nach allen Kronen streckt, die Fäde an. Betörte euch, mein Wappen anzunehmen, euch meine Königstitel zuzueignen, auf Tod und Leben in den Kampf mit mir zu gehen. Der Streich war meinem Haupt gedroht, jedoch das eure fällt. Ich stehe in Gottes Hand. Ihr werdet euch so blutig eure Macht nicht überheben. Was soll mich hindern? Blutsverwandtschaft? Völkerrecht? Die Kirche trennet aller Pflichtenband. Den Treubruch heiligt sie, den Königsmord. Ich übe nur, was eure Priester lehren. Oh, das ist euer traurig finsterer Argwohn. Ihr habt mich stets als eine Feindin nur betrachtet. Doch hättet ihr zu eurer Erbin mich erklärt, wie mir gebührt. So hätten Dankbarkeit und Liebe euch eine treue Freundin und Verwandte in mir erhalten. <lacht> ihr, meine Erbin, dass ihr zu meiner Lebzeit noch mein Volk verführtet, die edle Jugend meines Königreichs in eurem Bulernetz verstricktet. Regiert den Frieden. Jedwedem Anspruch auf dies Reich entsage ich. Ich bin nur noch der Schatten der Maria. Die Kerkerschmach hat meine Mut gebrochen. Ihr habt das Äußerste an mir getan. Jetzt macht ein Ende, Schwester. Sprecht es aus, das Wort, um dessen Willen ihr gekommen. Denn nimmer will ich glauben, dass ihr kamt, um euer Opfer grausam zu verhöhnen. Sprecht dieses Wort aus. Sagt mir, ihr seid frei, Maria. Meine Macht habt ihr gefühlt. Jetzt lernet man den Edelmut verehren. Sagt's. Und ich will mein Leben, meine Freiheit als ein Geschenk aus eurer Hand empfangen. Bekennt ihr endlich euch für überwunden? Wie ist aus mit euren Ränken? Ist kein Mörder mehr unterwegs? Will kein Abenteurer für euch die traurige Ritterschaft mehr wagen? Ja, 
Es ist aus, Lady Maria. Ihr verführt mir keinen mehr. Die Welt hat andere Sorgen. Es lüstet keinen, euer vierter Mann zu werden. Denn ihr tötet eure Freier wie eure Männer. Oh Gott, gib mir Mäßigung. Das also sind die Reizungen, Lord Lester, die ungestraft kein Mann erblickt, neben die kein anderes Weib sich wagen darf zu stellen? Fürwahr. Der Ruhm war wohlfeil zu erlangen. Vielleicht gilt man als die allgemeine Schönheit, wenn man gemein und feil sich macht für all... Das ist zu viel! Jetzt zeigt ihr euer wahres Gesicht. Bis jetzt war es nur die Larve! Ich habe menschlich, jugendlich gefehlt. Die Macht verführte mich. Ich habe es nicht verheimlicht und verborgen. Falschen Schein habe ich verschmäht mit königlichem Freimut. Das Ärgste weiß die Welt von mir. Und ich kann sagen, ich bin besser als mein Ruf. <lacht> Wehe euch, wenn sie von euren Taten einst den Ehrenmantel zieht und mit ihr gleißend die wilde Glut verstohlener Lüste deckt. Nicht Ehrbarkeit habt ihr von eurer Mutter geerbt. Man weiß, um welcher Tugend willen Anna von Boleyn das Schafott bestiegen. Ja, die Gott. Güter nicht an, Hinrich. Das ist die Mäßigung, die Unterwerfung, Lady Maria. Mäßigung! Ich habe ertragen, was ein Mensch ertragen kann. Wein, lammherzige Gelassenheit, zum Himmel fliehe leidende Geduld. Spring endlich deine Bande, langverhaltener Groll. Sei der Rasen, der schwer gereizten. Der Thron von England ist durch einen Bastard entweiht. Der, der Briten Edel hat sich Volk durch eine List gegauklerin betrogen. Regierte Recht, so legt ihr vor mir im Staube jetzt. Denn ich bin euer König. So, there we have it, and uh, that's the scene where, yeah, everything we spoke about before happens. Um, and as you saw, I think uh, essentially, like Mary Stewart, uh, it's that she's she's putting hope in false prospects, and then when those false prospects, you can see before the Queen arrives, there's that excitement that she feels like this this she might be going hunting today. There's this kind of child in her that thinks that, but she knows the rules of this system. She, she's, she's kidding herself that, that they've come to free her because, well, it's not going to be that easy. And the thing is, the, the lies and everything, um, the lies uh, that are taking place. Sorry, I'm just going to check the chat. Chat box here. Right, yes, that was about the subtitles. Thanks. Um, do you hear me now, everyone? Hello? Is, is anyone there? Yeah, loud and clear. Yep, cool. I can hear you. Um, just so you know, um, well, I think we're going to do another scene. I'm going to save the talking for the end because then we're, we're going to open up Q&A. Um, this is the, um, the two women in their respective roles. Elizabeth won't move from her position at all. She actually shows up. She has no intention of really moving. Um, that's that. She represents the empire in all of its, you know, Yeah, vanity. And then Stuart, Mary Stuart, she actually renounces all claims to the crown. So she, she's like, I'll keep sacrificing. I'll keep giving you this and give that and give that and give that. It, none of it moves, Elizabeth. Doesn't matter what she says now. Like, even if she gets on her knees and kisses her feet, Elizabeth will be happy that she's doing that because this is exactly what Elizabeth wants her to do. No, this, this woman's fate is pretty much sealed unless Elizabeth can find it within her heart to actually move to the to the kind of order that, that Mary is trying to get her to move to, which is like forgiveness. Can can you find it within your soul to forgive me? And uh by forgiving me, the thing is, if she'd kept her alive, she would have been her successor because that was the rule. Uh Mary was next in line to the throne. Elizabeth didn't have any children. That's it. It would have been Mary Queen of Scots before James I of England, the James James the Sixth of Scotland. So um, who ended up being, a, you know, not, not such a good king for the sake of, you know, he watched his mum get executed in front of him. James was actually there and uh, had been taught to calmly accept this 
this tragic event that his mother's being killed in front of him. I mean, we have like uh, parallels with this with Princess Diana and stuff, right? So, so um, I mean, there's certainly parallels. So here is Act Five, Scene Seven. And uh, this, we see a different Mary, someone who's more capable of uh, transformation. And I'm so Ich habe alles Zeitliche berichtigt und hoffe, keines Menschen Schuldnerin aus dieser Welt zu scheiden. Eins nur ist's, Möbel, was der beklommenen Seele noch verwehrt, sich frei und freudig zu erheben. Dem treuen Freund vertraue deine Sorgen. Ich stehe am Rand der Ewigkeit, bald soll ich vor den höchsten Richter treten. Ach, Möbel, versagt es mir der Priester meiner Kirche. Ich bin ein Priester. Deine letzte Beichte zu hören, dir auf deinem Todesweg den Frieden zu überbringen, habe ich die sieben Weine auf meinem Haupt empfangen. Und diese Hostie übergebe ich dir vom heiligen Vater, die er selbst geweiht. So muss an der Schwelle meines Todes mir noch ein himmlisch Glück bereitet sein. This is Elizabeth. Willst du nicht morgen werden? Soll ich noch länger auf dieser Folter der Erwartung liegen? Wird es geschehen, wird es nicht? Mir graut vor beidem. Und ich wage nicht zu fragen. Lester zeigt sich nicht. Auch Burley nicht. Die ich ernannt, das Urteil zu vollstrecken. Sind Sie schon abgereist nach Fothering Hay? Dann ist es geschehen. Pfeil ist abgedrückt. Er fliegt. Er trifft. Ich kann ihn nicht mehr halten. Fühlst du dich stark genug, um jede Regung der Bitterkeit des Hasses zu besiegen? Ich fürchte keinen Rückfall. Meinen Hass und meine Liebe habe ich Gott geopfert. Ich komme, Lady Seward, eure letzten Befehle zu empfangen. Dank, Milord. Mein Testament nennt meine letzten Wünsche. Ich habe sie in Ritter Paulitz Hand gelegt und bitte, dass es treu vollzogen werde. Verlasst euch drauf. Und weil mein Leichnam nicht in geweihter Erde ruhen soll, so dulde man, dass dieser treue Diener mein Herz nach Frankreich bringe zu den meinen. Ach, es war immer dort. Es soll geschehen. Was ist dir, Hanna? Ja, nun ist es Zeit. 
ihr. Wer das soll? Und meine treue Hanna sollte mich auf meinem letzten Gang begleiten. Ich habe dazu keine Vollmacht. Wie? Die kleine Bitte könnt ihr mir weigern? Es darf kein Weib die Stufen des Gerüstes mit euch besteigen. Ihr Geschrei und Jammern... Sie wird nicht jammern. Ich verbirge mich für die gefasste Seele meiner Hanna. So there we have it. That's the moment before her death. And um, actually, in that recording, we we don't have um, the full speech that I have in the book because they switched to the scene of Elizabeth. This production, I actually quite like that. I, uh, just on a personal note, like the switch to the production where they show Elizabeth uh, what she's going through while this execution is being carried out. I, I quite like this because there's this. Uh, reflective thing that you see even in Elizabeth she's still a human being she's still gonna have to deal with this tragedy but um and I was gonna go now play the the I have a recording here which I encourage everyone to listen to it's also on YouTube I can put the link in the chat after but this recording's in English and it's much closer to the translation by William Wurtz which like having looked around at different translations is, is the best like hands down and um but still this is an english spoken version it's it's not you're not going to see the play you'll just hear the the words i would play it now but you won't hear it but even in the intention of their work the their script in the way that they're saying things it's really good to listen to this um you'll get really uh good sense and uh, the cat like she's scottish and she's speaking with a Scottish accent. So you get a really nice uh, context with this version too. I'll leave it in the chat box after so that everyone can um, have a look. But that is the end of the class today. Um, I'm gonna open it up to a Q&A now. Everyone can take themselves off mute if they wanna, if there's any questions, we wanna talk about possibilities, um, fire away. Yeah, thank you, Nick, so much. And uh, what you can do is send me the uh, the videos, and I will splice them in so people will be able to hear the German um, as well as read along um, in the final video that's going to be on YouTube. And we'll have additional literature by Schiller, including the original play that people can uh, link up in the description box of this video. Um, so yeah, it's a great class. I, I really appreciate how you were able to mesh so many different facets of world history together from the context of what was going on with the political intrigue of the day. Um, I just wanted to say one little thing. And for everybody who wants to ask a question, ideally put your name in the, the chat box like usual, and I'll call upon you in queue. Um, I was just quickly doing a review of that uh, portrait by Elizabeth the first or of Elizabeth the first and uh, reading up on it a little bit while you were speaking. And uh, yeah, it's a celebration in a sense, portrait of the uh, defeat of, a, of the Spanish um, at a very important battle, but she's pointing also at, at the new world, specifically at Virginia, which right. was named based on her name, right? Yeah. So that's an interesting uh, precursor to the, the developments that would proceed for the next 200 years leading up to the American Revolution, what were the dynamics and the fight over, uh, you know, what would be the role of the new world as a game changer in uh, the global strategy. So that's kind of cool. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really cool. This is some nice color. Mm -hmm. uh, Pascal just got in. So Pascal, what's your question? Yeah. Hey, thanks, Nick. Pleasure, man. Um, yeah, very interesting subject. I'm glad that you, uh, you were uh, going into more details into what uh, I had alluded to, but I, I didn't really uh, go too much into in, in depth uh, during my presentation, which, you know, would have been out of bound for me. <laughs> so thank you. No pleasure. Um, <clears throat> my question is, I'm, um, I'm wondering to, to what extent, because obviously we know that drama is not necessarily... Um, uh, can be can be a great introduction to history, but doesn't have to be uh, factually perfect, right? No. And so, um, in this case, yeah, certainly not. 
yeah. in drama, no. So I was wondering to what extent, because um, I, I, I think there were, you know, uh, Schiller took some uh, liberties in uh, how he was writing the play. I don't know if you, uh, if you wanted to, uh, if you know a bit more about these and what he changed and to what effect he would have done that. I'm, I'm thinking from what you said uh, previously, I, I don't know, I might have missed something. You, 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 maybe you alluded or, or said something about that before. But I was wondering about the relationship between Mary and Elizabeth. And I think uh, we're pretty sure that they, they haven't met in the garden, right? As, as Schiller puts it in the play. So I'm, I'm wondering what, what more, you know, yeah. It's, this meet, this it's meeting. Debatable. It's debatable, but. It's debatable. You know, it's really debatable. It's it's yeah. really, really, it's kind of, it's a myth a bit. Yeah, definitely. It's not recorded in the history books. But Schiller is really taking this poetic license to uh, use, um, well, he, it's that thing that we spoke about, what is universal history? What's the point? Like, why, why tell a story anyway? Because it's a history. So why tell the story anyway? And Matt was, saying Matt said something earlier about the um, about the usefulness of it. Uh, it, 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 it the theme of variation application is that it's useful for the future. And so if it's not, if, if, if we leave these events as merely um, you know tragic and um, they, they can have the effect on the human psychology where it's, it's depressive and, and leads one to feel, Uh, or have a sense that basically history doesn't move us forward or doesn't progress us forward. And I think as an artist, he's looking at this as a historical event and he's like, well, I don't have all the facts at my disposal. And he's obviously done a year. I've looked at the, the, the formation of this. He spent a year, like to pretty much to the day in, in his research and development of it. The act he starts like, the idea comes like seven years before, Where he's like, he's doing the Wallenstein trilogy and he's like, oh, Mary Stewart. And there's some writings that go down for him as like, this would be a great thing to do. But he actually focuses on the play for a whole year and gets it done in, um, I have it written somewhere, it's like uh, 1789. Yeah, and... Um, Yeah, so he doesn't have all the facts. It's 200 years later. And he also speaks about this in his universal history that, you know, a lot of what we have is not written word. And until it was written word, until it was monumental, we didn't have any way of recording these events uh, until we had the written word. And then from even from out of there, like there's myth and there's reality and there's, um, you know, people are using metaphor to describe things for the sake of danger and for the sake of being watched. Um, so sometimes to understand meaning, um, when you're telling a story, there is got to be a certain poetic license for you to escape um, having to be too literal about stuff, because the moment that would happen, you destroy the, the point, the, the, the essence of this event. And that's where I think for him, it's more important to give his audience, because it's still a drama, historical, but still a drama. So he's like, he's got a stage and a frame and he's like, well, I'm in like 1784 and like, we need a story and we need a story that tells us like, you know, we need to learn from this. We need to, we need to actually use this as like um, material to move humanity forward. And there's definitely something in these characters, which I feel is like a missed opportunity. Um, that it's not just tragedy. There's, there's this possibility, there's potential even in this battle going on between oligarchy and creativity. And um, it's also in that battle that he needs to show that, like as a process of history, that it is a battle between good and evil. And there is this very real angels and demons things taking place. And we use all sorts of colorful metaphor to talk about it, whether it's Grimm's Brothers Fairy Tales or Shakespeare, but it's happening and there's got to be these ways of expression. Like, otherwise, if it gets too literal, people are like, yeah, like, 
I don't believe that. So like he has to find um, a method, a, a, a medium for that expression that captures our sense first so that we actually care to think about Mary Stuart in the first place and ask ourselves, what is she falling on? Why is she a fallen, fallen angel? Like, uh, who's risen again, I guess, finally, but yeah. I, just quickly, I would, I would like to, uh, a second one. Wait, uh, before you do that, uh, could you do a stop uh, screen share, Nick? Sure, Wait. yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, Pascal, yeah. Um, Okay, so uh, my second question would be about the relationship between uh, Elizabeth and Mary. I was wondering about uh, the, f well, you said, you know, that the empire was, uh, uh, was really taking a hold at that point, right? The British empire was, uh, was getting uh, uh, bigger and bigger. And um, well, cementing itself within Britain first in this time, right. not exactly. yet, not yet expanding in terms of like an empire would. Yeah, taking over. Taking I over. actually think we're we're having our republic empire moment mm -hmm. in uh, Henry VIII, and essentially he chooses empire, and then Elizabeth is the 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 cementing of that empire within the domestic scene and weeding out all of the good elements of the English Republican uh, ideology, like people like Shakespeare, for example, weeding those people out and separating them away from the monarchy, like pushing them as far away from the monarchy, like basically the people who are off the Thomas More fellowship of people, which there definitely was, uh, 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 a group of like-minded men thinking along those lines who were of his uh, education, right? Because he had his own, he had his school and everything. So, um, of which Henry went to and was a participant in. And, uh, yeah. Do, do, you, do you think, I don't know, I haven't really looked into it. I'm wondering, you know, uh, when you have these different characters and obviously, you know, Schiller doesn't just say, you know, Mary is the good one and Elizabeth is the bad one, right? No. It doesn't make sense. No. Do, you think, do you think that he's portraying in a sense uh, Elizabeth in a uh, kind of pejorative way to try to shift the understanding of how people in his period, in his time, were looking at it? Yeah. No, I like the way you said that. Yeah, I think so. Okay. And uh, what would I have to add? Not, not much. I mean, yeah, I do think so. Because I think that that is the nuance. She's not just bad. She does actually have potential to be good. She's a human being made in the image of God. And she's the queen of England. And she's her father's queen, like daughter. She's like clearly a talented woman. Mm. She's got gifts, is what I'm saying. But um, you can actually, when you read the drama, I've read it a few times now. Every time I read it, that nuance gets more and more constructed in me where I see like oh, Elizabeth I feel for her like I do I start to feel for her because I'm like you have this gaping opportunity in front of you with this woman as your successor you have real legacy you returned the, the nation state to Catholicism which is a building a, a, a bridge a, a form of dialogue between the, the Reformation and the Catholic faith which was clearly necessary, necessary again after the schism. We had to rebuild bridges of dialogue. Otherwise, you know, that, that's just it with people. Once you've made the split, you can't um, rewrite history. So there could have been that, that potential for dialogue. And with Mary Queen of Scots being the, the successor in line, actually Elizabeth did everything that was unnatural to make sure that that wouldn't be the case if she actually let nature flow. Uh, within herself too and let her senses arrive at a common agreement with with the rules of the time because it's not even the rules making her kill this person she's been told a lot of lies that she turns into rules and like I can't unknow this about you now you're a dirty slut like you hear it in that scene right there's this moment where like um, and they'll be your fourth husband and like it's very like 
you know, off the cuff. And it's like everything that Elizabeth's saying is basically slander. Slander that she holds as truth. And this is where she's just utterly failing. She actually believes that these men have her own best interests at heart. Like, of course they don't. They're telling you this to, to make you do all sorts of evil. And you're committing willingly. That's the worst part. It's like almost she has the feeling to save it or like to stop it. But that vanity just won't allow her to make, you know, a unification in her mind and, and be a hero instead of a tragedian. Uh, you know, tragic tragic character down downfall fallen all right thanks pleasure man thanks for sorry <laughs> okay that well, i want to preface my question with a comment um that bastard queen line you mentioned is is significant yeah uh because in the catholic view the Henry's divorce from Catherine of Aragon was illegitimate and Mary therefore was properly the queen of England after Mary Tudor's death. Um, so my question, and then the, the Babington plot was one of these uh, schemes to try and put Mary uh, Stuart on the throne. So was, um, my question is why, what's it? That was Walsingham. He forged the letters. He's British yes. intelligence. He's the beginning of MI6, essentially. Sure. Um, what does does that should that and does why doesn't it play a more significant uh, role in Schiller's play um, in in your mind? Hmm. For the fact of like the specificity of it, with I mean, because if it gets like too good and evil like that, it kind of destroys the nuance. I mean, I feel like he's allowing us to also draw our own conclusions. This is where the poetic license part comes in. There's, he could tell us um, what he thinks history is, but maybe it's that he's not quite sure. And that for all of the research and development that he's done of the, of the drama, there is, there's missing gaps in history. He actually talks about this in the lecture on universal history. He talks about gaps. Um, like uh, things that haven't been recorded and how we uh, navigate that. And he's talking about common sense and reason again, that, that you, ha you have a certain kind of license as a universal historian to fill uh, somewhat the gaps with uh, a reasonable beauty that for the sake of the future will uh, increase the, the, the sense and sensibility of, of future times, right? Like he's mm. trying to lead us somewhere rather than force us somewhere. And I think that's what's actually so powerful about it. Um, that's what is so powerful about art in general. It's not conclusive, it's freedom. And as an audience, we're invited to be free with our mind, not to the point of like whim or like, I don't know, get naked on stage and dance around. No, that's not, not, that, not that kind of like, whatever that is, because that's not freedom. But like, and that, that's what we have in, in certain artistic realms today. That's how bad it's gotten. But uh, for actually to allow the audience to be independent in their mind and to say, hey, I agree, or I disagree, or actually maybe that could have happened, or, you know, maybe that could have happened. Or, But the common theme is that there was potential more than anything the common theme is that there was potential. One character arrives at her potential, the other doesn't. The tragedy is in somewhere in all of that, that, that one of them can't climb to the same echelons that the other does. And we're left with the question, well, why? And why is it that humans fall on things like vanity when actually Elizabeth could have had a far greater legacy? Like, you know, actually if, if it's really about vanity, history would have uh, given her a much better place in the stars had she acted accordingly, you know, had, had she done right by Mary, who, as you rightfully said, is the rightful uh, heir to the throne after Mary Tudor, given that Elizabeth is a bastard queen, because Anne Boleyn, uh, anyway, she, they never got married, but she was an agent of Thomas Cromwell, so already there, like she, she's a pretender. And um, oh, yeah. thank you. That that was a beautiful answer. 
sorry, yeah, because it's it's hard to bring these things to conclusion. But I guess that's the point. <laughs> Sometimes it's like not about that. It's just about freedom and being able to think about these things. Is it vanity or insecurity? Or did I skip someone? Because that was no, I just put it in. Uh, Magdalena has veto rights uh, in that in that relationship between, with Jerry. So uh, yeah, you could treat that. First if you want. <laughs> no, yeah, it's a vanity or insecurity. No, because you mentioned vanity a few times, and I was actually wondering if it's really vanity or if it's insecurity. Because in her mind, I believe Elizabeth is also not quite sure is if she's actually actually the legitimate leader of. Britain, okay, sure. yeah, and, and she is trying to justify her leaders or so her so-called leadership role, right? I, I, I'm not sure if it's vanity. Well, I would say though, I mean, no, yeah, okay, definitely, yeah. There's there's a, a separation there, but for me, vanity and insecurity, it, it's coming from the same place in the soul it's um vanity would come out of insecurity um if if you are insecure about these things uh the only way you could uh say that they are true is through a process of vanity you have to force that they are true i am the queen if you know that you're not vanity would probably be the only thing that convinces everybody around you that you are is all I would say about that. But vanity is not coming from a place of security. That's for sure. Because there's no need to be vain where there lies real confidence, which is coming out of love, right. you know, act of love, where we act for the other, not because the other tells us to, because we love the other and we care for the greater good. So we act for the other, not for them, but for us, because that's salvation. So Vanity is coming out more of that that evil nature of the human soul, uh, that that evil side of it, which has the potential to um, bore something which masquerades for the sake of truth. Because something must in a real world with real consequences. We have the truth or we have the illusion of. And if you are acting under the pretense of the illusion of, vanity is the best i've got as an actor or as an artist to like i must force this on all of you through vanity and pomp and circumstance and everything else that has come with our the british monarchy and many monarchies like the past 500 years since that is born and actually you can see even the way that they're dressed in that too mary's all in black and uh some like uh solemn and um, humble, and uh, everything is part of this. She, she's, from what we are wearing and what we clothe ourselves in to, you know, how we present ourselves is important in the sense of like, it gives an apparition of character. In that already, you see in the dress choice, you know, Elizabeth is very much about um, procession and, and being on parade all the time as this Virgin Queen, this static example of what monarch is. And Mary Stewart's a human being with like all of her humility. And um, actually there's this wonderful part in the play, which I wish we could, yeah, just like she talks about this idea that I've paid for my sins. Uh, she's like shouting at Elizabeth, like, you know, like I've been through the darkness and come out the other side. Like, what have you done? Um, you know, like I see all of your darkness, but it's covered in this, um, this masquerading that you're doing. And you know, one day when all of that is stripped from your bare body, you're going to have to answer to, to the man, like to, to him, like to God up there, right? So um, think about that because like, though I may be and the world thinks of me this, I know I am better than what the world thinks of me. I don't need vanity to live every day of my life. I live on the truth. So um, right there, she's having her moment. Like, you know, I've developed my character. Like, what is it? You're no sister of mine. She said thank you. In many ways. Yeah, thank you. All right, Anybody Jerry? else? Yeah. All right, husband mine. <laughs> yes, I have a question. 
may I? <laughs> of course. Uh, he, he was asking no, Magdalena. I was asking Madeline. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. No, I've uh, I've really been looking forward to this class of yours, Nick. This is uh, I've been doing some reading because of uh, Martin Seif's class on Marlowe being Shakespeare. So I'm reading this whole period, which is so confusing, but yeah. it's this, the period in this play that you're talking about really is a, uh, it's a turning point that defines everything. I, in mm. fact, I think till Schiller uses that expression, the punctum salients that it, it comes to a point and that's deciding. Mm. I know, well, the the underlying thing all of it is this manipulated religious war right the protestants versus the catholics and you know the venetians both in venice but also in geneva really control the radical protestants you know calvin knox mm -hmm. these but there's also the manipulation of the catholic church the pope because i i think the pope at the time he was the former Grand Inquisitor. And so he wasn't such a great Pope. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think he had issued a bull against Elizabeth, excommunicating her uh, from the church, but also telling all of the Catholics they don't have to recognize her as the ruler. They don't have yeah. to obey her. So, okay, she may have vanity, but <laughs> there really was... There's a real problem there. Yeah, there was an attack against her. There was many assassination attempts against her. But ah, I'm, I'm trying to look at, at this period as, you know, this, the religious war, that both sides were being manipulated, both the Protestants and Catholics. And um, I think with Schiller, he's kind of showing Mary and Elizabeth as like representatives of the two sides and how they're manipulated. And can you, not just between Mary and Elizabeth, but can you resolve this religious crisis? That's, do you think Schiller was trying to do that? Was he looking towards that as like a higher idea instead of just Mary and Elizabeth? Because I'm trying to piece this thing together. You've put a lot of pieces together for me but I still got work to do no yeah I couldn't put it by my, better myself I, I, I love everything you said yeah that's great and uh yeah no it's it's it is that there's um you know in that actually you save Elizabeth as well because like you say she's being manipulated too so um we, we can't solely blame her and there is a very real problem for her she's a monarch she's been challenged and the Pope is telling people this. Uh, then she has this queen pop across the border. You know, it, it, and at some point people are telling her like, you know, she's conspiring, she's conspiring. No, she just got kicked out of Scotland because Scotland's going through, you know, torrid time. And actually these people are probably um, responsible for this too. And you see how all of these parts become a whole and in, in, in the sense that they're, the tragedy that's about to take place is set up for them to fall upon. It's like a trapdoor for them to fall into together, hopefully, maybe. Um, I think all of the agents around these women don't don't care about the, the characters themselves. So it's just, yeah, it's, it's great what you said. It's uh, really, really the point of the matter. Okay, thank you. I'll give people one last chance. If you've had a question on your chest and you've just been a little bit nervous to get it out, now's your one last opportunity to throw it out there at Nick. I, I just want to say, I, I think, you know, Gerald made a good point about being a religious war represented in the two women but i like that because everything always comes down to individuals like we all make you know it's it's less abstract and and more like really about feeling and um 
personal decisions that we make. And I think that, you know, I'm glad that Schiller kept it to the personal because right. in the end, that's really where uh, it, it begins from. So that's yes. all I need to say. Yeah, I love that too, that, that he's telling us like, you know, these emotions, they, they do come first. And so it's a requirement that you govern them. Otherwise, you, you're going to fall on these same tragedies as, as these other characters. That is really, I think, yeah, the, the, the individual quality that we will take away from it for ourselves in our own characters with all of their uh, difference and, and uniqueness. But there's that universal quality, that, that thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and I think, yeah, all, all of these great classical tragedians, they're, they're all able to really make that as transparent as possible so that even though they know, and we know that Schiller knows all sorts of, um, he knows a lot. He's a master of intelligence operations. He, you know, showcased uh, the networks of the Jesuits. Uh, he's, he discussed different networks in, uh, in the ghost here, how Freemasonic uh, deconstruction operations work psychologically for political ends. He understands Venice. He understands all of this stuff. But he, uh, he chose to really focus on the question of self-induced folly, right? Like what happens? The, the, all of these operations only work based on individuals who don't know themselves adequately and then make foolish decisions that undoes their own better sides, like their own um, themselves and those who they even might care about, um, which reverberates deep into the future if we don't make those corrections. But it's individuals, like like you said, Satomi, I think that that's, that's a very good point. Um, very, very good point. So with that, I think this sets the stage nicely um, for next week, where we'll have an introduction to um, Alexander Pushkin and the uh, the Soul of Russia by Professor Valeria Nolan, who's uh, taught in Saint Petersburg, uh, all over the world. Anyway, she's she's a real she's also a, a published poet her, into her onto her own right. Um, so that'll be next Sunday at two p.m. Nick, you've, you've inspired me as well. I, I think I, I was going to do something different when the time comes for my, my presentation, which is still a ways away, but I think I'm going to actually tackle the Thomas More utopia dynamic in more detail because of what you just did um, and make that my focus. So Luke, thank and you. I, Luke and I were talking about utopia the other day, so it's just, it's just yeah, perfect. Nice. That would be awesome. Great. i got to read it, actually. i still got to read it. Oh, it's a lovely little piece. Yeah, it's not that yeah. long either. It's... Um, yeah, and, and just to like get across how like why was it that the American colonies were ultimately the, it was like a British uh, revolution, right? These 13 colonies, it, it, it yeah. wasn't something that came out of a vacuum and called itself America. It, it came out of a whole dynamic that occurred within England. Britain for a reason. And what yeah. you just did really put the light on, on a big, big part of that drama. So I think that that's great. And Utopia, the fact, you know, that that definitely sets the stage for sure. the fight for the new world. Wonderful, yeah. That's great. Hey, Pat, when's your when's your class for uh, uh, Utopia? Down the way. I mean, it's 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 buried. It's like six weeks or something. Okay. Yep. Guys, I gotta talk to you about something. Please do. Yeah. All right, guys. Happy Sunday. Thank you so much for taking the time, and thank you, Nick. Thank you all. It was a great pleasure to do this. Loved it. Yeah. Great topic. Nick. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Right. Yes. Right. Thank Have you. Have a great Nick. evening. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thanks, Jared.